the embattled chief minister is destined to spend four additional days in ED custody. On April 1, the matter will be heard once again. And viewers, there are no guarantees that Mr. Kejriwal will get relief. Today, of course, viewers, the court went into the arguments and after a recess, reconvened and said that we would want Mr. Kejriwal to spend four additional days answering certain pointed questions that the ED expects to put before him. But all of this was not before Mr. Kejriwal today stood up in court and argued his own case. That's right, Kejriwal, brimming with his trademark self-righteousness, pointed out inconsistencies in the Enforcement Directorate's case with loyally felicity. During his own defense, he conjured up some astounding revelations that have set tongues wagging. And let me walk you through, viewers, some of his arguments that he pitched himself. He says, no court has convicted me. There has been no case against me. YSR CP MP Mangunta Reddy came to me seeking land for a trust. Mangunta Reddy later changed his statement and named me. Mangunta Reddy's son was released after he named me. C. Arvind claims handover of policy documents at my home in my presence. But several MLAs and dignitaries come to my home. C. Arvind's statement is baseless. Are mere statements from accused enough to arrest a sitting chief minister? He turned, of course, viewers, to the opposing counsel and said, consider this. If I were to get up tomorrow and accuse the Prime Minister or the Home Minister of corruption, would you arrest them? Mr. Kejriwal went on to say people are being clearly forced to change their statements. The accused turned approver. Sarath Reddy, for instance, gave 55 crore donation to the BJP. 100 crore scam has been alleged, but money trail has not been traced back to me. The motive of the ED is to crush the Aam Aadmi Party ahead of the elections and the Enforcement Directorate is on a mission to target me personally. These were the things, viewers, that Mr. Kejriwal said in his own defence, but clearly the court did not immediately stamp its authority on any of his claims, extending custody by four days, even though, viewers, the ED was seeking a longer duration. The ED, while not specifically responding to Kejriwal's significant revelations, stuck to the script. It listed in meticulous detail why it wanted more time to question Mr. Kejriwal. And let me walk you through, viewers, the ED's claims. The ED says Kejriwal is the kingpin and key conspirator of Delhi excise scam. And how do we know all of this, viewers? Because we access the remand note that was presented before the judge by the Enforcement Directorate. The ED in its remand nook has said that Kejriwal was directly involved in formulation of excise policy, that he demanded kickbacks from South Group for favours via policy, that Kejriwal's aide Vijay Nair was the middleman to secure kickbacks, 45 crores from proceeds of crime used in AAP's Goa campaign. As AAP convener, Kejriwal was the ultimate decision maker AAP has committed offence of money laundering via Mr. Kejriwal. The ED went on to say disobeying nine summons leads to inference of Chief Minister's involvement. Kejriwal giving evasive replies in custody during custodial interrogation. The ED said you await details of financial records, logins, an appointment diary from the Chief Minister. Remember viewers, this entire case hangs on certain meetings that took place at Mr. Kejriwal's residence. Now, the appointment diary would therefore be extremely important. And also, viewers, certain documents and financial records need to be looked at. And once extracted from instruments like mobile phones and computers, presented to Mr. Kejriwal for him 
to clarify. Now, while the Enforcement Directorate has not specifically rebutted Kejriwal's witness-fixing allegation, it might have a task at hand dispelling the notion that its star witness is not credible viewers. Here are some facts which Kejriwal is bound to dredge up. The chronology in which these facts appear certainly prompts questions. Now, viewers, look at your screen. We are talking about this individual, Sarath Reddy. On November 10th, 2022, Aurobindo Pharma Director Sarath Reddy was arrested by the Enforcement Directorate and accused of unfair market practices via excise policy. He was accused of conspiring with other businessmen and politicians. November 15th, five days later, viewers, Aurobindo Pharma purchases electoral bonds worth 5 crores. So on the 10th, the ED makes its claims. On the 15th, Aurobindo Pharma purchases these electoral bonds. On November 21, a week later, BJP encashes a sum of 5 crores via electoral bonds. And two years later, viewers, or rather a year later, June 2023, the court allows Reddy to turn an approver in the case against Mr. Kesriwal. The court grants pardon to Reddy in the excise policy case, which was obviously, viewers, a plea bargain. Now, Mr. Kesriwal believes that this reeks of quid pro quo. Let's open this up, viewers. This is an important matter. It's an important case. The Enforcement Directorate has the onus now to prove its case against Mr. Kejriwal. And let's bring in, first things first, the BJP national spokesperson, Mr. Ajay Alok. Mr. Alok, what we witnessed today in court is Mr. Kejriwal taking the stand himself, defending himself and making revelations which point towards, in his words, witness fixing. How do you respond to this charge? I've read out certain events that took place and the chronology of those events. See, this heroic was being planned since yesterday when Sunita Kejriwal announced in the court, mm. uh, announced on sitting on the CM chair that Kejriwal is going to do something big tomorrow in the court. Mm. So everybody was anticipating a summer kind of dramatics was going to follow. So all those theatrics and dramatics continued in the court that in spite of having a battery of lawyers, he decided to argue for himself and instead of giving a particular answer about the evidences that ED have gathered that more than 15,000 pages of documentary evidence and he's not being cooperating at all. That's what the ED lawyer said in the court to the judge and why he has not been cooperating because he's a lawless person. And what is lawlessness? A lawless person makes will his will his law. That is the problem. And this is the sect which is operating. And I call them Aam Arajak Party, not on basis of this. They are Aam Arajak Party. They don't follow the law. They don't follow the system. And they will create some other theatrics. But this is not going to work. Court functions according to the basis of evidence. And there is an evidence which needs to be probed, which needs to be investigated. That's why the remand, uh, the remand has been extended. Now, all this electoral bond and this and that is just trying to divert the strategy because everybody knows that the electoral bonds every party has taken, whichever has taken, it's there in the books. It's the white money. Now, if somebody is saying that yes, BJP is doing extortion by taking electoral bond and then giving them advantage, then how come other parties are getting it? Then only BJP should have got it. No? So, all these frivolous excuses are not going to help Mr. Kejriwal. He is bound to get convicted in this because there are evidences and this is, and mind you, this is not the only one scam. There are list of scams which are pending and investigations are going on. So they will have to take it. It cannot work like that. Mr. Joshi, let me bring you into this conversation. You've been uh, obviously holding up the corner for the Aam Admi Party for a while now. So I want to ask you this because this is an important question. Mr. Kejriwal gets up and makes a revelation which could blow this entire case open. But the court, the court pays no heed, extends his custody by four significant days. And if he doesn't cooperate, of course, Mr. Joshi, you know that the ED will come back and make the same plea, saying that we need more days, till in a sense, 
Mr. Kejriwal cooperates or we have enough material for him to not deny it offhand. So, Mr. Joshi, why is the court not sympathizing with Mr. Kejriwal or his other lieutenants? First and foremost, the courts will, we have discussed it uh, a number of times that the courts will adjudicate according to the law of the land. And when it comes to the PML Act and subsection 30, 45, you know, I'm not a lawyer, but, uh, you know, I've read so much about it. And the amendments done in 2023 makes it almost impossible if the enforcement directorate is saying that the uh, uh, so-called accused is not cooperating. So, for you know, for enforcement directorate, uh, an opposition leader's cooperation means uh, that he should, uh, you know, accept that he is guilty. Otherwise, he is not cooperating. It is as simple as that gets. Now, Ajay Alokji has made, uh, you know, so many tall claims uh, that, you know, uh, Mr. Kejriwal has done that and that and it's a lawless, he's a lawless man and everything. I mean, lawless man means to him that he makes, uh, you know, what whatever suits him is the law. So, uh, by this definition, I think Prime Minister Modi is the biggest lawless man in the country because uh, he amended the PMLA Act, he amended the GNC, uh, GNCTD Act. And um, uh, he, 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 he went back and forth on so many things. When, once the Supreme Court adjudicated on those matters, thereafter he misused the parliament and passed those laws. And those, those, those are still under uh, the purview of Supreme Court. The Honorable Supreme Court is still listening to the matter. So that is that. But he did not answer the important question that uh, since Sarat, Sarat Reddy was one of the prime accused in the matter, was he not following the money trail arising out of his own company? Uh, a very important company he, in which he was one of those directors. So, and how did the ED allow this to happen? Did the ED not keep a track on uh, the transaction in the accounts of Arbindo Pharma? I don't think ED is, uh, ED is as, as, as naive as, uh, as has been portrayed. If 50, uh, 60 odd crore rupees, mind you, it's not only 5 crores, it's, it's a transaction worth of 60 crore rupees uh, in electoral bonds. So, 60 crore rupees starts from Arbindo Pharma and at the BJP headquarters and that is the only established money trail in this uh, so-called... Uh, okay, like so Mr. Camp. Joshi, you That's say that under, under the PMLA Act, it's a foregone conclusion, you are guilty unless you prove yourself innocent. So, why then does the Ahmadmi Party and all the other lawyers that are obviously, you know, appearing for the AAP even bother to file these petitions? Then forget it, sit at home. Well, you know, it's it's not like that. Yeah, it, it, it is no, what do you mean it's clear. not like but that? Either it is like that or it's fight. not like that. I mean, come on. Baba, Rahul ji, Rahul ji. No, no, you, Mr. You Joshi, you, you this is a bizarre argument, argument that you're using that, oh, you're condemned argument. under just, the PMLA forever. Just, you can't come out. Then why are these bail applications just, just, moved umpteen times by Mr. Sisodia, Sanjay Singh, Kejriwal ji and others? So, so, so that when the final judgment is pronounced, uh, our stand will be vindicated that what we have been talking <laughs> oh, about. So, you're just years, going through the motions. Over half years down the line. Viewers, you know, the, we, we were, I don't we, know. Don't know if people to fight as well. go to court to fight for as well. political so reasons, I would think they would go to court to get justice. This is almost sounding like what those 600 lawyers have written in their letter. That there is That's political right. grandstanding that is going on. Anyhow, let's let's let me very quickly. Okay, the BJP national spokesperson wants to respond very quickly, and I want to open this up. Yes, I just I just have two two points to make. Mm. If law is required for curbing corruptions, then it's the responsibility of the person in the power to make law. Okay. That's why you are in government for. It's not for and law is for everyone. Not only for the opposition, it's for the ruling party also and everyone. That's why Modi ji makes laws and that does not make him a lawless person. Okay. Kejriwal is lawless because before becoming okay. CM, he was steal, stealing and elected to make laws. Seen. He's a legislator second, at the end of the court, day. Today in the court, today in the court, okay, okay, today, in the court yeah, today, in the, today in the court, today in the court, Kejriwal now has said to the judge that the, whatever the money came, it is already spent in the Goa election. So where is the money trail? He himself admitted that. Okay. Isn't well, this true? Well, look, we are not going to go into the merits. This particular hearing was about giving credible reasons to extend custody. The ED has given several. I can go back into the ED remand note and tell you the two or three important grounds which might have swayed the judge. But Dr. Ranganathan, let me come to you and ask you this fundamental question tonight. Is this case blown open 
because Mr. Kejriwal took the stand and made these revelations, are we now supposed to think that the onus is back on the ED and the next 96 uh, hours hold the key? Uh, good evening, uh, uh, Rahul, to my fellow panelists. Look, I have very briefly six points to make and I want to make them very quickly. First of all, I this air has to be cleared. Forget about the stubble burning that AAP uh, indulges in from year to year. But this air has to be cleared because the AAP minister, Ms. Atishi, has perhaps committed a contempt of court by claiming that the Honorable High Court in its order has raised serious questions about the political motive behind the arrest. The court did no such thing. In fact, the court quoted the petitioner as raising serious questions. So it's not the High Court that has raised. The High Court has stated, and I let me quote the High Court order, because, you know, this matter has to be cleared. This insinuation has to be completely flatly rejected. Number one, the petitioner has also raised serious and critical questions before the court and stated that this court, being a constitutional court, must apply its mind to the motive behind the arrest, which is patently illegal and has a direct bearing on the democratic process of impending elections in the country. This is the High Court quoting the petitioner as saying, the High Court is not making this statement. Secondly, the present petition raises several issues of legality and validity regarding the arrest and remand of the petitioner. Additionally, it questions whether the arrest may be politically motivated and malafide. The High Court is not questioning whether the arrest is politically motivated. The High Court is quoting the petitioner, i.e. Kejriwal, from questioning whether the arrest is politically motivated. So this mudding of water is helping no one. This has to be clarified and I am through you. I, am, I hope that the viewers get this absolutely picture clear cut. Number two, for all those who are saying that the ED has been using draconian provisions, like the uh, previous panelists, let me inform them that each and every provision has been vetted by the Supreme Court three judge bench and not only ratified, but also underlined and stamped. For example, you mentioned about the, reverse, the burden of proof. The reverse burden of proof, Rahul, is now here to stay. Secondly, it is not mandatory to give ECIR. Third, bail to be made extremely stringent. Fourth, money laundering is to be considered as heinous as terrorism. Fifth, attachment of property is to be allowed. Sixth, statement made to the ED are to be made admissible. This is a Supreme Court that has vetted it. Finally, did the Supreme Court not say that bail is a rule, jail is an exception? Why then, I ask, has bail been denied to AAP ministers implicated in the liquor scam? In fact, let me quote the Supreme Court order of two months ago pertaining to the excise state court. The excess amount of 7% commission earned by the wholesale distributors of 338 crores constitutes an offence as defined under Section 7 of the POC Act. These are proceeds of crime. Fourth, only once three ED summons are ignored by law, the next is non-bailable warrant to be issued for arrest of the person who is ignoring the summons. Kejriwal ignored nine summons. Five. The ED conviction rate for PMLA cases is 95%. So this isn't some political witch hunt. And an Aam Aadmi respects the law of the land. By the way, 30 seconds. Is this not the same Aam Aadmi party, Rahul, that arrested a Congress MLA six months ago on a case that the Supreme Court had itself squashed? And then the Congress MLA was arrested based on investigations carried out by the same ED. Then the AAP said, let law take its own course. And here, it is not willing to make the law take its own course. And finally, 10 seconds. May I know under which authority and provision of law is Mrs. Kejriwal using the chief minister's chair to wax eloquent? Okay, last question. Could you respond to it, uh, Mr. Joshi, very quickly on what capacity is uh, Ms. Kejriwal's wife using that chair? She is not sitting in the chief minister's office. She is addressing uh, the people of Delhi and the people of the country uh, from the video conferencing room of her own house which happens to be her residence right now because Mr. Kejriwal is still the chief minister. So how can you say that she is using the chief minister? Okay. She is sitting let me in the bring secretary. In Sanjay Jha. So stop slandering. Okay. Please okay. explain. Don't, don't slander, etc. Et okay, let me just bring in uh, Sanjay Jha. Sanjay Jha, forget about Sarat Reddy for a few moments. Mm -hmm. The statement for one of the candidates of the AAP of Goa elections in 2022 is also recorded during this period who has revealed that he was not having any money and his election expenditure was taken care by AAP of his Delhi only through their associates, number one. Number two, 
during the ED custody, data in one mobile phone belonging to Mr. Kejriwal's wife has been extracted and is being analyzed. However, data from four other digital devices seized during search at Mr. Arvind Kejriwal's premises are yet to be extracted as the arrestee has sought time in providing a password and login credentials. After mm -hmm. consulting with his lawyers, <coughs> if he has nothing to hide, why doesn't he just give these credentials, which is mm -hmm. of course the passport and login. And how do you explain an AAP candidate himself making these claims, which further supposedly the ED line of inquiry that money raised in Delhi was spent in Goa? Uh, okay, Rahul, pretty serious questions. If you don't interrupt me, I will try and answer it in a nutshell. It's not just Arvind Kejriwal. They have arrested Manish Sisodia as well as Sanjay Singh on the same Delhi liquor scam. I want to ask a basic question that any citizen of this country will ask. Such a powerful body, the ED, it has so many talented officers. It's taken over a year for the trial to begin, for the cross examinations to happen. Where ultimately I've been a banker, boss. I can I can tell you any anybody will ask this fundamental question. Paise kaha hai? And there is no money. Because the truth is that excise law actually was never operationalized. Therefore, you are never going to see any money here. It never became a law which was in practice or in vogue because it was actually withdrawn. That's the point number one. Point number two. How can you ignore Sarat Reddy? I think your viewers have to understand the ridiculousness of the prosecution's case. The ED called him the kingpin of the liquor scam. So is the ED saying that we were stupid or we were lying? There are only two options. Either the ED says we were stupid or the ED says that we lied. Okay, because on what basis did he become an approver? Suddenly the ED decides to say we have no objection to the bail. And this man says he blames Kejriwal. Now here is my question. I even have no problem with that Rahul. But here is the, here is the big issue that Narendra Modi should answer. Forget, forget anybody else. Nirmala Sitaraman need to answer. That same Sarat Reddy's company gives electoral bonds of 55 crores to the BJP. So the BJP through the ED says this man is the kingpin of the liquor scam, then takes money from the same guy and based on his Sir, verbal... Can I ask you a counter question on this point about. itself? It's a scam. Sanjay Jhaji, can I ask you a counter question yeah. on this point? Yeah. Do you know there's a man called the Lottery King of India? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. A man called Mr. Martin. Mm -hmm. Now, I believe that the Congress party that you belong to has two major allies. Mm -hmm. The DMK and the TMC. Mm -hmm. Now, this Lottery King mm -hmm. has paid more than almost six to eight hundred crores, by some estimates, mm -hmm. a thousand crores between, mm -hmm. between these two political parties. Mm -hmm. And you know that he was under the scanner. Was he doing mm -hmm. it because he was paying hush money, protection money, hafta, call it what you want to? Okay, I'll answer you. I'll answer you very quickly, Rahul. Good question, by the way. I'll answer you. It's not just future gaming. Yes, sir, I'm Pharma. asking you specifically about minute, this. I'm answering your question. I'm answering your question. Patience, patience. I'm answering your question. And I want Ajay Alok to answer me because he tried to be very clever in his defense. He said, well, it is a one-off. It is not a one-off. ED is an extortion racket. We are a sir, mafia. Sir, I'm asking you a specific Hafta question about Mr. Country. Martin. If I'm Mr. Martin pays money, he's under the scanner. He was mm -hmm. being prosecuted. If he pays money... Almost mm -hmm. a thousand crores to two mm -hmm. allies of the Congress party that mm -hmm. you are today contesting the poll with. Don't mm -hmm. forget, at least mm -hmm. one in DMK, in Tamil mm -hmm. Nadu, are mm -hmm. these political parties also getting hafta or securing hafta to yeah, give them protection? Tell you why they are not. Because I'm these political you. parties have in the past banned central agencies from yes, executing yes, so their mandate Rahul, on their own soil. Rahul Jaram, mujhe bolne do. Come on, you be, be a gentleman. I'm answering your question. I'm only You're asking not you the question, sir. I'm not yeah. cutting you off. Uh, Rahul, yeah. five minutes. So, let, let, so let me answer you very quickly. Here is the case. Who, by the way, does the CBI or the income tax or the ED report to? The finance ministry. 
I would like Nirmala Sita Raman, who today said she doesn't have enough money, to kindly answer because okay. the responsibilities with the finance minister. Okay, viewers, look, look at the way I'm Sanjay Jha has now sidestepped this question because I'm I'm I not added not two points, viewers. Very important. Not important. Not one second, Sanjay ji, one second, please. I yeah, added two very important points, and the point is that these state governments have not once but twice prevented prevented viewers withdrawn permission. To central agencies, well, sir, right. allow me, allow me, allow me. Say, it might be their right. It might be right. their right. It might be their right. I don't know. Because I'm not. Don't a, one second, Sanjay ji, please. Let me finish. Okay. I hope let you finish. let me come in later. No, no. I will. I will. Let me. Let me just finish, please. Because Viewers, I, I asked a simple question: part. Was Hafta being paid by a man called Martin, who is supposedly the lottery king of India, under the lens of the ED and other investigative agencies, to two state governments? And can, can anyone explain to me if Sanjay Jha is today accusing the BJP, the ED of extorting money from I'm a particular you. individual called Sarath Reddy to make him into a witness? How I'm does that not apply you. then to the DMK and the TMC yeah, yeah, so who also you. have the powers to block investigative agencies from the center to show up in their states? And guess where this great lottery king resided? Yeah. So let Yours. me answer you. And Ajay Alok, I hope you are listening. Mm. Kevinter Agro raided. Sir, forget Yashoda, it. There are many, many people. Arvindo there are many people. They've City given money now. I am asking you a very specific, like project. for like question, and I'm not getting a like BJP for like answer. Okay, BJP spokesperson for. comes in. Response, sir. It's a scam, Ajay Alok. It is the biggest What's scam the since okay, 1947. Okay, BJ, you you took so money, right? Okay, you you also Sanjay, Sanjay, Sanjay Jha, the Sanjay Congress Party Sanjay took Sanjay money, Sanjay right? Operation. Why didn't they not? Why did they not take Aftar money? Why did they take money? So, आपने भी तो पैसे लिए under the same scheme क्यों लिए? I'm sorry, there is no quid pro quo. अरे there is no quid pro. अच्छा, there is no quid pro quo. Okay, okay. On this issue of quid pro quo, viewers, there is no quid pro quo. There is no quid pro quo. It is the BJP. Says. Oh right, BJP there is the, it is is the BJP. I see. I see. BJP has given away contracts. Right, right. Okay, okay. You, 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 are, you were you were living off love and fresh air, of course. Okay, that's bizarre. I mean, viewers, 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 viewers. If the scheme, if the scheme is corrupt, and you take money under that scheme, you say, "Nee, humne to good faith me liya." Though the scheme is corrupt, dusre aadmi to corrupt hai. Unhone isliye liya. Come on, boss. Rahul. Sorry, now sir. the opposition called <laughs> look, the open. Look, called why don't you be honest today? Can I why don't you be one? honest? Why don't you yeah, be honest? Called the electoral no, bond a sham. Not, not, a not the Congress party, sir. It was the left party, the Marxists, who you are Everybody fighting in Kerala today. Who you no, are no, fighting no. in Kerala Everybody today? They are the sham. only ones who went. Anyhow. Viewers, Hello, look, Rahul, I am not sitting in defense. I am not sitting India. in defense of the EB scheme. First of all, I am only catching out the hypocrisy in the answers that I am hearing. Okay, very quickly, Dr. Ranganathan, you are raising your hand. Yes, very quickly. Yeah, let's not muddy the waters. Uh, uh, is my only suggestion. Yeah. Yes, there are four approvers, not just one. Yeah, I am restricting myself to just this case. So even if you were to say yeah. that one approver is a bit shady. And under the carpet or cause or whatever, there are other three who are very robust. If you were to look at, they are sons of uh, MPs and MLAs. There are people who have said that yes, yeah. in my presence, this and this happened with Arvind Kejriwal. One is secretary of Manisha Sodia. One is the son of the, uh, I think, one uh, MLA from Andhra and Telangana. And as far as the approver under question is concerned, yes, it it looks terrible. I have to say this. Fact of the matter is. That the same guy who is now turned approver, Mr. Reddy, also gave. Yes. Uh, I think the same amount to TRS as well as to yeah, the uh, the other uh, the party, Telugu Desam Party. Absolutely. And the fact is, he became approver six months after he gave the money. So these guys were obviously expecting quid pro quo. They are giving donating to every political absolutely. party. Absolutely. Now, viewers, look, we are not here standing in judgment the merits of this case. Yes. We are only today talking about the fact that once again the benefit of doubt has not been given to Mr. K. Zewal, and you heard Mr. Joshi saying, "Are under ED, so, boy, you don't get bail at all." So then I asked him, "Why do you keep filing bail applications?" He says, "No, no, no, just because we want to be vindicated in the end." Viewers, you square that logic in your own head. It's I'm taking right a very short fight. break. Yeah, it's that's fine. Right you have a right fight. now. You're saying we have a right to file. Great, sir. Don't be, don't be. Let me, let me, let me just country. take a short break. I'll be right back. Viewers, very big issue.
600 lawyers led by Harish Salve write a letter to the Chief Justice of India. What is this letter about? Is it true? The revelations that are made, we are right back. We haven't had anything like this happen in Baltimore. Um, all of a sudden, you're like, I saw it on the internet. I'm like, oh my God, a bridge collapsed somewhere. And then I'm 10 seconds later, like, oh my God, it happened here. So immediately, you start transitioning you, the effects of this. And it turns into, uh-oh, we know that the, the maritime transportation is going to be cut off now, which is a huge part of what we do. We're bringing products in from all over the world, obviously. Um, and we're exporting product to South America, the Far East, Europe as well. We can't ship anything out right now, so the exports have been shut off. So obviously there's nothing we can load in containers to go out of the country because there's no vessels to load it on. You know, the vessel traffic has stopped. So, um, and with no incoming containers, you know, that will be shut off as well. So sooner or later, you know, the port's going to just quiet down. It's going to be, I hate to use the word, but almost like a ghost town here, um, probably within the next few weeks. We're not the only one who's, who's uh, Okay. Sorry, I gotta find a way to, to get to it. Yeah, yes. With the amount of cargo that comes into this country, it's, you need to understand how, I guess, what, how, how fragile this can be. You know, who would ever think this would happen? I mean, this is, you know, everybody's worst nightmare, obviously, in Baltimore, the crazy things that happen. So there's a, a lot of behind the scenes that happen to get your, you know, your Amazon package to your door or just being able to go to the grocery store and uh, a local merchant to get your product. People losing their lives in this just terrible accident and the tragedy. Um, you know, hopefully they can we can locate locate these people and, and it, my heart goes out to their families and everybody involved. But you know, uh, the next step, you know, as per President Biden, is let's we need to get the the channel back opened up. What that's going to entail, I, I don't know. Um, we're working with the Port Daily and you know, the state, local governments to see what we can do to get, us, get everybody back up and running here. I'm just a small piece of what goes on here. The Port of Baltimore blockade caused by the catastrophic bridge collapse is unlikely to trigger a new supply chain crisis in the U.S. or spike the prices of goods. That's according to economists and logistics experts. They said that's due to ample and growing spare capacity at competing East Coast ports. Several people... Viewers, it's fast turning out to be a day of revelations. More than 600 lawyers in India, including senior advocates Harish Salve, Pinky Anand, have flagged their concerns over attempts by court vested interest group unquote to influence the judiciary in a letter to the chief justice of india dy chandrachut the lawyers claimed that the group was employing pressure tactics to influence judicial outcomes especially in cases involving political leaders and corruption charges 
Let me quote out of this letter for you viewers. These are astounding, astounding charges being made by some very senior lawyers, very well respected lawyers. Attempts, the lawyers claimed in their letter by a vested interest group to influence the judiciary. Pressure tactics employed to influence judicial outcomes. Interest groups focus on corruption cases against political leaders. Propagating false narratives about so-called golden era of judiciary. Selective criticism or praise of the court. Decisions based on political agenda. So if the verdict suits your political outlook, you hail it. If it goes against it, you condemn the judiciary. Some lawyers, the letter says, defending politicians by day but influence judges via the media at night. There's a bit to discredit current proceedings and public confidence in courts. Efforts to belittle and manipulate courts for political reasons can't be allowed. These individuals argue in their letter to the Chief Justice of India, significant threat to democratic fabric and trust in judicial processes. The lawyers flag that some of the tactics employed by the group include selective criticism or praise of court decision based on either their political agenda, calling it a court, my way or the highway, uncourt approach. The letter notes, quote, it's troubling to see some lawyers defend politicians by the day and then try to influence judges through the media at night, uncourt. The letter highlighted that the group was peddling an entire theory of court bench fixing unquote and expressed concerns over court political flip flopping unquote. It goes on to say it is strange to see politicians accuse someone of corruption and then defend them in court. If the court's decision doesn't go their way, they quickly criticize the courts inside the court as well as through the media. The Prime Minister viewers was very quick to latch on to this letter written by 600 lawyers. He linked the group allegedly pressuring the courts to the Congress party. This is what the Prime Minister says, and I quote him, to browbeat and bully others is vintage Congress culture. Five decades ago itself, they had called for a committed judiciary. They shamelessly want commitment from others for their selfish interests, but desist from any commitment towards the nation. No wonder 140 crore Indians are rejecting them. Them means the Congress party. That's what the Prime Minister said. The Congress immediately hit back. Its national spokesperson and the head of its media cell, Jairam Ramesh, accused the Prime Minister of hypocrisy, saying that the Prime Minister must remember that it is the court that has dealt huge blows to his government. Jairam Ramesh talked about the electoral bond case. Let's open this up, viewers. Hitesh Jain, a signatory to this letter, is with us. Adisi Agarwala, Chairman All India Bar Association, another signatory to the letter is here with us. Vikas Gupta, lawyer of the Supreme Court, and Sumit Chandar, another lawyer of the Supreme Court, are with us. So let me first begin with you, Mr. Hitesh Jain. Why do you feel that you needed to write this letter? How imminent is the threat? And who... Is this cabal? India wants to know. Rahul, of late you'll be surprised to know what is happening inside the courtroom and outside the courtroom. And the kind of language that is being used for the court and for the judges both inside and outside. As far as the cabal is concerned, let us not go too far. You are aware recently that for a politician when you ask for a special relief from the court, and when the judge is not inclined to grant you merely because you have a political status, a cabal or the lawyer who is representing that politician reminds the judge about a golden period, a so-called golden period. What is that? That is nothing but browbeating a judge. Outside the court on the social media handles, there is a barrage of army who is sitting and trying to criticize Indian judiciary and they are trying to compare it with Pakistan and China. They are also name calling a particular judge. If they are not getting the relief, they suddenly start calling the name calling of the judges starts. See, as a lawyer, it is concerning because we win some cases, we lose some cases. But then to start blaming the judicial system, the judiciary and the judges is something like you are trying to attack the very institution itself. We win and lose on the basis of the facts in front of us, not on the basis of 
any other uh, motivations which they are trying to allege unfortunately on the eve of the election it happened during the 2018 2019 period also and it looks like that's the same playbook which is being applied now you start attacking the judiciary you start criticizing the judiciary and then you expect the international media also then to start uh, challenging the very institution and now let me deal with the comment of jairam ramesh that he feels that we are concerned about the bonds and all if that is the case then why is the lobby reminding the judge that this will not be called a golden period and why they are browbeating and why they are giving an interviews or name calling the judges so the fact is if you give the relief in our favor you are the judiciary is fair and independent if the relief is not what we want or the desired outcome is not what we want then the judiciary is biased and it is compromised that is the narrative which is being spread according to me this is a very dangerous narrative uh, okay. i mean like we rep- as i mentioned to you we win some cases and we lose some cases mr gupta is there an attempt to browbeat the judiciary as claimed by mr jain number 1 number 2 should we be weaponizing verdicts number 3 most importantly sir how can you say that the judiciary is being controlled etc etc many people have even said that it has lost its moral core when it pronounces critical judgments that go against the government of the day rahul if you can have a list of 800 names 600 names sorry uh, who have written this letter then they should also spell out few names for whom against they're talking about is it only few lawyers or a large community of lawyers or a public at large whether they criticize the judiciary or not i think that is important most important is that the interested parties in, in this poll if they are the ones who are criticizing that is a separate issue what since the legislature and executive today are is overlapping you have a majority in the parliament and the executive so judiciary is to be more vigilant i think that is more important what the public at large wants is a vigilant judiciary so that what the government has let loose the investigating agencies on the um, uh, opposition leaders or opposition parties i think that what needs to be seen and administered by the uh, judiciary uh, do you what think that the judiciary 20, is not doing a good job second now i'll just let me just complete 10 seconds yeah. in the second half of upa government judiciary was proactive in handling the investigating agencies taking so much to action against the corrupt leaders now what has happened today once you've let loose the investigating agencies on the opposition leaders the what is expected of judiciary is to be there for them to be more vigilant so that the investigating agency don't have a field day i think that is important what needs to be seen yeah but uh, uh, let me ask you a counter question do you believe that that's not happening that the judiciary is not being vigilant uh, don't no, forget I, that the ed is powers rahul i have never said that to be critical of any judgment that's the right of every individual in this country now to uh, criticize the judge per se i think that is wrong criticizing a particular judgment or having a different view point on a particular judgment is absolutely perfect in okay democracy. let me bring in mr agarwala mr agarwala let me ask you this question because it's important and i began by asking name these people out them you've written you know a letter you've named yourself identified yourself uh, mr gupta says look uh, you can't have this sort of you know uh, shadow sort of uh, attack from the shadows name the people see everybody is fully aware mr kapil sibal when he directly came for bail he should know the law of the land he has not practiced in lower court he should know that the bail application can be moved only in the lower court not in the supreme court supreme court pointed out that we can't give you bail in supreme from supreme court but he says no you decide because what he think because all the the pre- judges presently who are in supreme court they were appointed during congress regime so they feel that whatever order they want the judges are supposed to give that should not be they should not expect this thing judges judges are independent they are working as per law 
they go by facts and law so that's why the these people who were in power they think that these judges should act whatever they say this can't be tolerated that's why lawyers pointed out to honorable cgi that this practice is not good and judiciary should not come under their control okay let me bring in uh, the other supreme court lawyer here on on the show mr chandar mr chandar the name has been taken and that person also happens to be an active politician uh there is also of course a worry about political flip flopping underhand tactics and false information some elements are trying to influence who the judges are in their cases and spread lies on social media to put pressure on the judges there's also this charge about bench fixing that you may be aware of that has come up repeatedly now all of this is being done to suggest that uh, the judiciary is suborned that it has lost its independence that it has caved in under executive pressure in the face of a government that enjoys an overwhelming majority that there is an undeclared emergency that there is judicial barbarism all of these words have been used is this fair to impute motives rahul criticism of judiciary is not something new it is just that nowadays because of social media things have got a little hyped up but let me tell you this judiciary criticism judiciary in fact has never been immune to immune from criticism but when the criticism is based on some distorted facts or some gross misrepresentation of material averments only to intentionally lower the dignity and respect of this court then the courts must take cognizance of it so let me ask so you mr chandra this is, is very important do... you made a very important yes. point and let me be very yes. specific there was a justice of the high court who resigned his post and has now become a bjp politician and has got a ticket to contest an election out of bengal now what was said the moment he did so it was said about him that perhaps all the judgments that he has so far issued in his career perhaps were in favor of the bjp now it is not the first time that a judge has resigned or retired or taken voluntary retirement or what have you and become a politician in the ensuing days this has gone back even into the 80s and some very notable figures did it do you think this is not an attempt to browbeat yes rahul to undermine the confidence rahul that's a very dangerous domain very dangerous domain that you are entering into why now when you talk about uh, judges post retirement joining a certain political party it's a very personal issue but while you are at the bench when you are on that chair there is a respect for that chair when the decisions you take you take sitting on the chair you are doing that as a totally independent unbiased judge that is the respect for the chair that is a constitutional post but political parties that cannot the be DMC, undermined that other lawyers cost. who appear who are alloyed to political parties have been going out there and making these insinuations are these fair and is this not an attempt therefore yes, to browbeat yes i'm coming to that yes i'm coming to that like i said see criticism of judiciary has been there from ages ago it is not something new but those criticisms cannot in any manner in fact they do not i can say that with confidence with my experience that they do not influence the judge when a judge he is okay. passing a judgment he is seeing the facts on record he is not going by what the media has said or what has come by some lawyer statement in media he it is going purely on the basis of the facts before him that is why if you see the statue of the lady of law goddess justicia the she has a blind fold that blindfold signifies it does not matter who is standing before him what has been said ignoring everything what remains before the judge is only the facts before him on record so those criticisms the judges the judiciary is immune to those criticisms they are immune in but fact, should they be made see, it is very should easy. they be made in this personal way i remember after the ayodhya judgment a large number of people wrote editorials in a newspaper that i was <coughs> at that time writing for the times of india and this word judicial barbarism was used motives were imputed on the bench as you know because people said that majoritarian instincts had gripped the judges 
that goes against what you are saying see the chief justice Yes, no, but Rahul, keep that in mind. The, even the Chief Justice of India in one of his uh, lectures outside, he had said that, you know, ill-informed and agenda-driven debates or issues involving justice delivery are providing to be detrimental to the health of democracy. Now, the only thing that uh, CGI said that it okay. is best for the media itself, it Let is for me. the people to self-regulate and measure their words. Ah, that's not, not happening. Overstep any Why is that white not happening, Mr. Jain? It's not happening because you claim it will not happen because there's an agenda. That's See, what you're claiming. If it is if it is criticism, that's all right. We can always criticize a judgment, and nobody is going to make any issue about the criticism. But here, what you are doing, for example, a specific judge, where uh, reliefs have not been granted because the judge is holding a particular view. You suddenly start demonizing that judge. You are you start imputing the motive that so and so will okay. always give pro uh, pro government judgment. Moment an Ayodhya judgment come, motives are attributed. Moment judgment on Article three seventy comes, motives are attributed. So idea is when you start attributing the motive, you create the confusion in the minds of the public. Well, there is more confusion happening. Breaking news coming in. One second, Mr. Jain, you could re react to this also. Congress President Mr. Malikarjun Kharge has attacked the Prime Minister. Saying you conveniently forget that four senior most Supreme Court judges were forced to hold an unprecedented press conference and warn against court destruction of democracy on court that happened under your regime. One of the judges was nominated by your government to the Rajya Sabha. So who wants a committed judiciary? You forget that your party has fielded a former high com high high court judge in West Bengal for the current Lok Sabha elections. Why was this candidature bestowed on him? Who brought the National Judicial Appointment Commission NJAC. Why was it struck down by the Honorable Supreme Court? Modi ji, institution after institution is being bullied by you into submission. So stop pinning the blame on the Congress Party for your own sins. You have mastered the art of manipulating democracy and hurting the Constitution. Mr. Jain, quick response to that. I will tell you what is manipulating the judiciary and trying to answer for a committed judiciary. Committed judiciary is when the judgment, when the judges are not giving the judgment which are in your favor, you try to supersede those judges. When you want to appoint your own nominees to give the judgments in your favor, that supersession, what happened during the emergency, was an example of committed judiciary. And when did the Supreme Court come with the uh, judgment on the basic structure? Supreme Court was so afraid of the kind of power that was exercised by the Congress government, where the Supreme Court had to evolve, come with a theory of a basic structure. It well, was during the Congress regime. That is the answer. And well, we viewers, are all aware, we are all aware that if Congress is committed okay. to the rule of law, the habeas corpus case, the sub Congress had argued that during the emergency, okay. even your fundamental rights... Well, viewers, I, I don't intend to make this political, but the fact is, if any of these allegations are true, we must be forewarned. We must be forewarned and perhaps this letter is serving that purpose. I don't know, viewers. It will be interesting to hear from the Chief Justice of India. Maybe he might uh, issue a statement on this. We'll take a short break. We'll be right back. Don't go away. Go powered by the We haven't had anything like this happen in Baltimore. Um, all of a sudden you're like, I saw it on the internet. I'm like, oh my God, a bridge collapsed somewhere. And then I'm 10 seconds later, like, oh my God, it happened here. So immediately you start transitioning to the effects of this. And it turns into, uh-oh, we know that the, the maritime transportation is going to be cut off now, which is a huge part of what we do. bringing products in from all over the world, obviously. Um, and we're exporting product to South America, the Far East, Europe as well. We can't ship anything out right now, so the exports have been shut off. So obviously there's nothing we can load in containers to go out of the country because there's no vessels to load it on. You know, the vessel traffic has stopped. So, um, and with no incoming 
containers, you know, that will be shut off as well. So sooner or later, you know, the port's going to just quiet down. It's going to be, I hate to use the word, but almost like a ghost town here, um, probably within the next few weeks. Yeah, we're not the only one who's, who's a, with the amount of cargo that comes into this country it's you need to understand how i guess what how, how fragile this can be you know, who would ever think this would happen? I mean, this is, you know, everybody's worst nightmare, obviously, in Baltimore, the crazy things that happen. So there's a, a lot of behind the scenes that happen to get your, you know, your Amazon package to your door or just being able to go to the grocery store and uh, a local merchant to get your product. people losing their lives in this just terrible accident and the tragedy um, you know hopefully they can we can locate locate these people and, and it, my heart goes out to their families and everybody involved but you know uh, the next step you know as per President Biden is let's we need to get the the channel back opened up what that's going to entail I, I don't know um, we're working with the port daily and you know, the state, local governments, to see what we can do to get, us, get everybody back up and running here. I'm just a small piece of what goes on here. The Port of Baltimore blockade caused by the catastrophic bridge collapse is unlikely to trigger a new supply chain crisis in the U.S. or spike the prices of goods. That's according to economists and logistics experts. They said that's due to ample and growing spare capacity at competing East Coast ports. Several people were still missing after a container ship collision destroyed the Francis Scott Key Bridge on Tuesday. And it remained unclear how long the wreckage would block the harbour's mouth. However, the rescue search for more survivors was suspended on Tuesday evening, about 18 hours after the incident. Port officials down the East Coast were busy on Tuesday fielding queries from shippers about diverting Baltimore-bound cargo from containers to vehicles. The Port of Virginia is seen as a major beneficiary due to its close proximity to Baltimore, but Georgia Ports Authority said its Savannah and Brunswick ports were also poised to absorb some traffic. The situation is a marked shift from the clogged, understaffed ports and supply chain chaos of 2021 and 2022 that spiked prices and fueled inflation as Americans binged on imported In a special interaction between Prime Minister Modi and Microsoft founder and philanthropist Bill Gates, the two discussed the use of artificial intelligence in governance and the expansion of India's digital payments infrastructure that is spreading to other parts of the globe. Gates has said that Indians are not only adapting technology but also leading the way, hailing the Modi government's democracy via technology mission. Here is a teaser of that interaction that will be released to the public in full tomorrow. Wow. <laughs> One of the themes I think India brings to technology is that it, it should be available for everyone. Well, India brings to the climate uh, change a rich, rich history of caring about the environment. This jacket is the recycled material. We have made the parameters climate friendly. Today, we have made the parameters of anti-climate. During the pandemic,
ये वायरस वर्सेस गवर्नमेंट नहीं है ये लाइफ वर्सेस वायरस की लड़ाई यूर वन ऑफ द हार्डेस्ट वर्किंग पीपल एवर When you do want to relax, do you have a game or something that helps you to take time off? मुझे बहुत अच्छा लगा और कई विषयों पर ऐसे गप्पे मारने का मौका मिला. Good evening, hello and welcome. You're watching CNN News 18. This is the Right Stand with me, Poonam Burde. The heat on the Delhi Chief Minister continues in connection with the Delhi Liquor Gate alleged scam. Today, Rao's Avenue Court delivered a blow to Kejriwal during the custody hearing. The court extended enforcement director's custody for Arvind Kejriwal for four days until April 1st. Arvind Kejriwal is now going to be in ED custody. The court, in its order, said that there are sufficient reasons to extend Arvind Kejriwal's custody, particularly keeping in view that the probe agency needs to confront him with other accused. They also said that this interrogation and confrontation should be done without any delay. But during that hearing, we saw high drama that ensued inside the courtroom. Arvind Kejriwal argued his own case. It was a rare moment. He asked for time to present his own case. The judge gave him just five minutes to go on to say, despite there were objections that were raised by the Enforcement Directors Council. Arvind Kejriwal said this is a political conspiracy to crush his party. That was the only mission that the ED was out on. He alleged. Kejriwal said that the ED's sole mission was to somehow implicate him even though there was absolutely no evidence against